This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is August the 2nd, 2022, and I am in Woodbridge, Virginia, and I have the pleasure to sit down with David Schick. Am I saying that right, David? Yes, you are. Uh, I have the pleasure to sit down with David uh, through the miracle of Zoom. David, welcome aboard. Where are you, you at right now? Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And David, tell us your full name and where you were born. David Joseph Schick, S-C-H-I-C-K, and I was born here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And what branch of service and what um, wars and combat operations did you support? Well, I was in the Army National Guard and later the Army Reserves. Uh, I supported, or I was in Afghanistan for Operation Enduring Freedom, I believe. We were Phase 5, and then I was later in Kosovo for Kosovo Forces Iteration 9, and those were my two deployments. Outstanding. All right. So um, 9-11, where were you on 9-11 and what are your memories from that day? Well, 9-11, I had not enlisted yet, but I'd say that played a pretty key role in my decision to enlist. I remember I was going to college at the time. I was in my apartment with some buddies and my mother called me and said, you better turn on a TV right now. They knocked down one of the World Trade Center towers. And so I turned it on and I, I watched on TV the second plane hit. Um, and actually at the time, um, I was enrolled in an ROTC class, not under contract to ROTC. And I started talking to a bunch of guys that were in the national guard and were in that class. And that kind of motivated me to enlist. Any military vets in your family? Well, my dad was in the Naval Reserve for almost 23 years, including a tour in uh, Vietnam uh there was i had a couple uncles that were uh in korea one of those uncles was also in world war ii he was a long time in the army guy um had an uncle that served almost 30 years in the navy retired as a commander and believe it or not i even had a very long ago relative fight in the civil war for iowa so yes uh, i do have military background in the family so at some point in time, you have a conversation with a recruiter. Um, what what um, MOS did you guys agree upon, and um, how did that play out? Well, uh, I was a medic, so at first it was 91 whiskey, and then later they renumbered all the MOSs to – all the medical MOSs became number 68, so I got out as a 68 whiskey. Um, and I remember I had talked to a guy that – was a 91 whiskey at the time and it just sounded like the most interesting of all the MOS I heard about. So there it was. How long is that AIT for, for medic? At the time it was 16 weeks of AIT. That's not counting boot camp. Where was that at? Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And basic, where was that? For me, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Gotcha. Okay. So you, um, you get through basic training and AIT and uh, then where are you off to? Well, then I reported back to my National Guard unit, which at the time, well, it still is in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, and at the time I was attending the University of Northern Iowa, which is just the next town over in Cedar Falls. There were a lot of UNI students who drilled there at that armory. Um, and in, you know, the rumors were already, I got back, the rumors were already flying about a deployment. I, I remember I told one of the NCOs I wanted to go and he said, well, thanks for volunteering, but you'll probably go whether you like it or not. And then February of 2004, uh, I got the word that, yeah, I was on the list to, to go. And what unit is this? My home unit was headquarters company, 1st Battalion, 133rd Infantry Regiment. That's part of the 34th Infantry Division. This this is the desert version of my, di my division patch right here. Well, uh, the Red Bulls. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, um, but, but the thing is, the unit... The unit that was actually deploying was 1st Battalion, 168th Infantry, our sister unit from Council Bluffs, Iowa. And a lot of us from the 133rd got transferred to the 168 to fill their to fill the spots where they were short. Okay, so just so I got this right, so the unit you deployed with was, one more time? 1st Battalion, 168th Infantry Regiment. And it was also part of the Red Bulls. Gotcha. All right, so how, mu how much notice did you guys have before you're actually wheels up? Well, actually wheels up. So we, um, I think they gave us about a month's overall notice uh, that for those of us that were actually officially picked to deploy. But then 
we reported to Camp Dodge, Iowa, for the first part of our training. That was about two weeks. And then we went to Fort Hood, Texas, for about 10 weeks to finish up our training. And so from the time we were actually notified in January, we hit country in late May of 2004. So I'd say just about four months from the time that we were notified till the time we went wheels up. But from the time we were notified till the time we actually started active duty was probably about four weeks. Gotcha. All right. So um, you, did you fly commercial? Did they, how, how did that work in Afghanistan? Well, to get to Afghanistan, we flew, we flew commercial into, you know, on various hops into one of the former Soviet republics. Um, actually, it was, I think I can say this, it was Manus Air Base in Kyrgyzstan, a former Soviet air base. And then we flew from there, C-130 into Afghanistan. And my part of the battalion went to Bagram Airfield first. All right. So when you first get off the plane um in may of 2004 what was your your um initial assessment um uh, everything from weather conditions to what you're seeing well i mean what's going through your mind when you get on the ground um well the smog was the first thing but you know surrounded by mountains uh you know there's not a lot of mountains it's mostly flat land here in iowa so that's always interesting um you know we're there on bagram airfield the former soviet air base and now it's been built up by Americans for a couple of years at that point. Um, you know, just vehicles and personnel moving all around, Hesco barriers, uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't really, it's not that the base was never attacked, but we were within, well, within the perimeter at that point. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of hustle. Yeah. So, um, all right. So where are you guys moving to from there? Well, from there, the battalion split up because what we were doing was we were doing force protection for civil affairs soldiers that were interacting with the local government. And so the battalion split up into pretty much platoon size elements. And basically each platoon with our civil affairs team would occupy. Uh, technically, it wasn't a forward operating base, but basically it was uh, called a provincial reconstruction team base. And um, my platoon, which was 3rd Platoon Bravo Company of the 168 Infantry, um, you know, I was one of the attached medics. It was a regular infantry platoon. Uh, we went to the town of Ghazni, Afghanistan, which was one of the bigger towns in Afghanistan. I think the population was about 95,000. And from there, we, you know, the base was already set up. Uh, all we had to do was occupy it and, you know, it was base security and doing force protection for civil affairs when they'd go outside the wire on missions. You know, my role as a medic, uh, if I wasn't on a mission that day, I would staff our clinic. Uh, we do sick call. We'd see some local nationals, uh, depending on the situation. Um, and you know, when I, when I was picked, when I was tabbed to go on a mission, it was just, you know, the embedded medic with that platoon or with that squad, or however many were going out. So for somebody who who's might be watching this and, and, and was never in the military, can you explain the role of a medic in an infantry, um, you know, small unit platoon or a squad element and what your role is and how you fit into the big picture? Sure. Well, the medic, you know, we, we talked about AIT earlier. For those who may not know, you know, the medic has a lot of tactical medical training, like how to perform basic medical care uh, under, you know, under combat conditions, including under fire. Um, things such as how to stop bleeding, start IVs, restore breathing, some basic drugs, that kind of thing. And as the medic with them, my job was, you know, I would go and, you know, I, I had the ability to shoot, you know, I remember I carried an M16 for that deployment. Um, the idea of a medic being unarmed uh, it went by the wayside long ago, but still you're there to defend yourself and any patients you may uh, encounter. But Basically, my role was to be there in case somebody got hurt. I'd be there right at the scene within seconds uh, to start triaging and treating them, um, do any basic medical care that I could at the scene. And depending on how severe the injury was, might have to arrange for a medevac or might be able to get them back to base ourselves. It just depended on the situation. But basically to have someone with medical training right there at the scene, at the point of injury. 
anybody um is it just one medic per per uh, platoon uh that's the normal allotment but in this case we had a lot more because we knew we weren't just going to be the medic with the platoon we also were going to be you know like i said we we treated casual uh, we would allow a certain number of afghans to come onto the base every day for medical treatment but also sometimes we would set up what's called a cma mission that means coalition medical assistance mission and what that would do is we would bring the ambulance and some medical supplies with us and we would basically set up our mobile clinic in one of these villages and afghans would come to us with all kinds of medical needs uh, i've seen people who are still missing limb from soviet mines that's soviet not russian soviet mines um sick kids dying kids um i think i treated about a total of three thousand patients there and um so we would do that you know just as a gesture of goodwill try and have help people see the united states in a good light but more often than not um someone would come to these medical clinics and we would get intel on you know hey I know where there's a cache of guns or explosives or say something about, you know, maybe if there were some Taliban hanging around their village or something like that. So it was, we gave, but we got. Yeah. So, so. Um, to tell, you obviously treat a lot of patients, but what, what was your general um, understanding and, and, and your thoughts about the Afghan people, not, 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 not the insurgents, the Afghan people, were they pretty happy to see you guys, Americans or 50, 50, or what, how, how did that play out? Um, I think most of them were, um, I think that they realized that we were just there to, you know, we were mainly there to help. I mean, that we could, transition into butt kicker mode in in less than a second's notice but they didn't want that and we didn't want that so i think they were mostly glad that, glad that we were there um i think some of them were leery of approaching us kind of because you know there were insurgents there and, and and they might be they'd be afraid of the insurgents too you know they'd be afraid that um they'd be seen as playing both sides i guess but I think most of them were happy we were there. Mm -hmm. um, so back to your support for for um, American troops. Any particular incidents that stand out in your mind when you think about your time in Afghanistan? Did you have to treat any American um, casualties when you were over there? Um, well, yeah, I remember the incident where I earned the combat medical badge. We had um, we had a rocket attack uh, at at our PRT site. And we treated uh, at least one casualty for it. And um, fortunately, his injuries weren't that severe. Uh, and we were able to, I think he was off off post. I think he was, you know, down in his bunk for a couple of days. But we were able to keep him right there. We didn't even have to evacuate him. So, um, yeah, there were times when I would have to treat American casualties. Mm -hmm. Did you find, so when you're out on a patrol, or on a mission, what kind of gear are you carrying with you? How much medical equipment do you have? Well, I'd have, you know, we call an aid bag um, with just basic uh, medical, well, basic for me, medical equipment. Um, I would have, you know, some IV sets, some medications, uh, a lot of bandages, some um, things like a, you know, a combi tube and nasal tubes to restore breathing, some splints, um, just gear to, do what i could do there at the scene uh also um you know things like my helmet my body armor with my load of ammunition and that kind of thing i said i carried an m16 some medics carried nine millimeter pistols some got both it just kind of depended on where you were at and how rich your supply line was mm -hmm. at this point we were all in the desert camouflage uniforms the acus hadn't come out yet um when you're out on your patrols, how far out are you from 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 getting help? In other words, if you have a casualty, um, are you are you waiting, you know, ten minutes or an hour? I mean, how long does it take to get to extract a wounded patient from some of the patrols you guys are going on? Well, that would depend. Uh, it would depend on the availability of air, and in some of the situations that we were in, 
we would have had to transport somebody to a place that was big enough and flat enough for a helicopter to land. And we would, it would just depend. I could, it didn't quite reach this point, but there might've been a time when I would have had to keep a patient alive as long as a day before we could get extract. Some of the, I remember one place we'd go to, it was an orphanage and it was about 110 kilometers you know, just over 60 miles to get there, but it would take us probably five, six hours to get there just because the terrain was so bad. Um, and we were moving in Humvees at this point. We, I never worked with tanks, even though I was in an infantry unit, because the terrain was too rough for tanks. There were places there where tanks couldn't go. Just to give an example. So, I mean, to, to answer your question, it would just depend on the situation, how long it could take me to get a patient out to higher medical care. David, let me interrupt administratively real quick. Um, I was, the computer was buffering just a second ago. If sure. in the event that um, we get kicked off this, okay. just jump back in on that link, but give me a minute because I won't be able to jump back on until I download what's already been recorded. Okay. So if, it, if it shuts down, just jump back on, be patient with me. I'll be on in about five minutes, but it looks like we're back in the action right now. Great. Okay, let's talk a little bit about living conditions. So um, where are you staying at during this time? You said you're on Bagram? Well, we, we landed on Bagram. And I remember when we first got to Bagram, we were in these big uh, rock floor tents, like 100 people to a tent. And um, so that was, and it was right next to the flight line. So the noise was constant. It was hard to get any sleep at all. But when I got down to Ghazni, uh, my PRT base, See, that base, I think, it, it was fairly well built up. There was an old school there that had no longer been used as a school, but uh, that's where a lot of the officers and senior NCOs lived in the rooms there. And there were also concrete huts set up for the rest of us. So my living conditions were pretty good. We also had, you know, a mess hall, a gym, uh, an internet and phone shack, uh, a, a pretty decent sized Connex yard. Um, it was pretty well built up where I was. And so we were one of the bigger and more well-known bases. For example, we'd get people coming through just about all the time just to get fuel. Um, we'd have helicopters land there for a couple minutes and take off that had nothing to do with us. For, so it was, it was pretty high activity there. So you guys got like a normal, like a PX there and everything? You could buy like we did a, Listerine or whatever you want? I mean, it, well, we did actually establish a small PX. Uh, in fact, it was my section, the medics, that took care of that. And um, it wasn't what, what we had available depended on the day. But, um, yeah, we did have a small PX there. Mm. What about entertainment? What did you guys do in your downtime? Uh, well, a lot of us brought our own laptops with us. People would watch DVDs, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we had the internet available. We had the ability to call home and all that. Um, people bring books, people, uh, you know, people might just play cards or something like that. Uh, like I said, there was a gym too. So a lot of people got, got to be pretty muscular by mm -hmm. the time we left. Yeah. Um, did you, were you able to take advantage of any USO programming? Uh, a little bit. That was mostly a bagram. Um, they didn't really get out to the little fobs very much. They were more on the big built up bases like Bagram and Kandahar. Um, and maybe further out West too. I don't know how that worked, but I mean, when we were in Bagram, cause sometimes we, and I don't mean the whole unit i mean you know a couple of squads at a time might go into bagram for a couple of days um you know for admin reasons or whatever but um we take advantage of the uso a lot there but like i said it wasn't at our base much mm -hmm. um are there any incidents when you think about your time overseas in afghanistan are there any particular incidents that stand out in your mind um, whether it be something that's that's humorous or something that's extremely frightening or just something that, that just sticks in your mind about your time over there. Um, 
Well, I remember a time we were able to, um, one of the local political leaders brought his son to us and he had a cleft lip. He was only like four or five at the time, I think. And we were able to get him hooked up with our battalion surgeon and he was able to perform surgery and fix that cleft lip. For some reason, the incidence of cleft lip is pretty high in Afghanistan as compared to other places in the world. And that's a simple surgery for most American surgeons, but not for Afghan surgeons. Their their education system is very poor over there. So even, even a physician who's been educated in an Afghan medical school doesn't know how to fix that. And a lot of kids are just told, you know, hey, suck it up. But when we were there, that was one thing we were able to take care of a lot was cleft lips. And, you know, that's just the first one that came to mind. But like I said, I treated a lot of Afghan kids. One one thing I did, and my dad helped me out a lot with this, but, you know, when I, when I was over there, you hear of Afghanistan, you think of this high desert, and you think it's hot all the time. Well, where I was at Ghazni, our elevation was about 7,200 feet, so it was kind of like the Rocky Mountains as far as climate goes, meaning we did have a real winter over there. It was cold. And... I noticed that a lot of kids didn't have a lot of winter clothing. And so between my dad and I and some other folks back home, I organized a clothing drive for Afghan kids. And it got way bigger than I thought it was going to get. They ended up sending over, and this is just people around Cedar Rapids making donations, ended up sending over over 2,200 pounds of winter clothing. Wow. Uh, Coats, hats, jackets, gloves, mittens, what have you for these kids um, and people were just donating and we'd go someplace as as with civil affairs and I'd give some of the stuff out um, when I left I don't know whatever happened to it hopefully they gave the rest of it out um, but I'd say that's probably the biggest thing mm-hmm. from over there is just the, that clothing drive <laughs> how long was your tour Uh, The tour was scheduled to last a year. Uh, I left after about 10 and a half months, and that's because my mother had a heart condition. She ultimately ended up dying in September of that year, Um, but I got to get reassigned to one of the armories um, here in Iowa to finish out the balance of the tour just so I could be with her and take care of her. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your homecoming. Um, well, we, uh, so the official homecoming, uh, you know, we went back to Fort Hood, Texas to, to demobilize and out process. And then, uh, there was like at every town that had an armory and mine was up in Waterloo, there was a big ceremony organized at a, you know, like a local venue, like ours was at one of the gyms there at the university of Northern Iowa where, you know, families and friends were invited. It was open to the public. And we'd all march in and form up. And, you know, there'd be a couple of people give speeches and that kind of thing, welcoming us home. Uh, they'd dismiss us. And at that point, we'd go back with our families. And we would have, I think it was two or three months where we didn't have to report for drill. Um, I don't remember exactly how much time off I had. But... Um, yeah, we, there would be a ceremony and we'd be released to families and friends at that point. Mm-hmm. So at some point in time, you have another deployment to Kosovo, is that right? Yes. So when was that and what was that all about? Well, I started, I, I got the word of that in March of 2007. And the way that that worked uh, is, again, I went from headquarters company, first the 133, to Alpha Company first, the 133, one of the infantry line companies. And then that company got attached to 1st Battalion, 194th Field Artillery out of Fort Dodge, Iowa. And so we activated in, there there were some of us in key positions, including the medics and some of the officers and senior NCOs and all that for the battalion that activated in June of 2007. And the medics... And all this, we went to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, which is their National Guard post there in Indiana. And the medics, uh, you know, we had extra medical training we had to do. Uh, 
and the admin, the, the, the NCOs and the officers were basically setting up shop, setting up command there. And then in June of 2000, no, correction, July of 2007, then the rest of the unit, the rest of the battalion came out to Camp Atterbury. And that was, you know, the way Kosovo originally got started was the U.S. and the U.N. intervened between the, the Serbs and the Albanians and the religious fighting and that kind of thing that was going on over there. And well, they, were, they kept troops over there for several years. Well, so we were training basically on what we called SASO, which stood for Safety and Stability Operations. And what that was was a lot of peacekeeping, maintaining order, um, patrolling, that kind of thing. It was a little bit less aggressive posture than Afghanistan, but we were still ready to do that if we had to. So we got to Germany in... September of 2007 for to finish up our training, which I absolutely loved because I'd never been to Germany before. And we did get a couple of passes over there. That was great. Uh, then we got into Kosovo in October of 2007. And we were, you know, we'd interact with the local government and that kind of thing. Um, David, real quick, we, let me cut you off. Sure. I, I guarantee you 90% of the people listening to this have no idea where Kosovo is. Tell us. Okay. Tell us geographically. So Kosovo, sure. Kosovo was in southern Europe. Um, it's not part of either Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, it's it was a part of Serbia for many many years, and that's one thing I was getting to is that they actually broke away from Serbia and declared themselves an independent nation. But it's in southern Europe. Um, it's not too far from say the Adriatic Sea. It's if you look at Italy, Kosovo maybe is two hundred miles east of that like central and southern Italy. Um, I mean, the people there are not Italians. It's a whole separate ethnicity, but that's just kind of an example geographically. Yeah, thank you for that. No problem. So when we were there, it was a lot of, you know, patrolling and, and interacting with the local government and that kind of thing. And by patrolling, you know, it wasn't like the... In, in Afghanistan, where we were, the missions might last several days. I remember twice that I was out for seven days. Um, there were a lot of times I'd be out for three or four days. There were plenty of missions where you, we'd leave in the morning and be back to the base in the evening, just depending on what was going on. Well, Kosovo, um, except for once, uh, the missions were all, you know, leave the base and get back, you know, that same day. Um, unless maybe we happen to get back past midnight. Um, are you working with UN troops or is it all like where you're at? Is it all American? Well, it's a UN mission, and so technically the UN controlled us at that point. Um, my unit was all American, but there were other units of other countries stationed there at the base. I remember there were there was a combined Polish-Ukrainian outfit. There were, I think there were Greeks there. Um, other sectors in the country, you'd have British, Irish, Italian, um, French, and what have you. Um, but there were a lot of different nations involved in the Kosovo operation. Um, but the biggest incident I remember when I was in Kosovo, um, so the Kosovo, Kosovo had established its own parliament and decided they were going to vote for independence. And so they sent one of the platoons from my company, including myself and a couple other of my medics. So um, I'll explain that in a minute to Jalan, Kosovo. See, if you have Camp Bonstio, which is the main American base in Kosovo, right, that's right next to a town called Yurosovac. Well, about 30 miles east of that is a town called Jalan, and for many years there, they had a base called Camp Monteith. Well, Camp Monteith had been closed, but the U.S. still owned it, so we could put troops in there and take them out anytime we wanted. So my, this, my platoon went to Jalan, um, because Kosovo's parliament had decided they were going to declare independence and we wanted to, but, but there was still some people down in Southern Kosovo where we were that were very pro Serbia and Serbia didn't want Kosovo to declare independence. I mean, obviously no nation wants to lose part of its sovereign territory. So we were there basically in case rioting broke out in Jalan. And because we were told to be there. But I remember one day 
it was actually the day before they declared independence. Uh, there was a squad of us, including me, that went out on a foot patrol. Um, some AP photographers took pictures of us. I ended up on Yahoo News. Um, I mean, I wasn't quartered or anything like that. Just myself and another soldier were you know, on this patrol. We, our, our picture was taken, and we ended up on Yahoo News. And the next day, I, I honestly don't remember now whether it was February 8th or February 9th of 2008. That's when Kosovo raised its own flag for the first time at Parliament in Pristina and declared its independence. And I was actually on duty for that. So that kind of jogged my memory of another thing in Afghanistan, the first recorded election they'd had in many, many years. I was on duty for that, too. So in a way, I was um, on duty for the beginnings of democracy in two nations. So not a lot of people can say that. But the thing about Kosovo with that, um, at least in our district, the American district, there wasn't really any, I mean, there might have been some local fist fights or something like that, but there was not big riots going on, at least in our district. I think the Kos I think most of the Kosovars were happy we were there. And the very few who weren't knew that we could have all kinds of military firepower to bear within minutes. Um, a lot of them had fought against Serbia and understood exactly what fighting a war was about and frankly didn't want to get back into it if they didn't have to. So, um, How long was that tour? Uh, we got there in October of 2007 and left in July of 2008, so just about 10 months in country but with training and all that beforehand it ended up to be about 13 months for me and um i don't i don't think we talked much about this what what, what were your accommodations at this point are you guys staying in like gp mediums are you in a building what, what no in kosovo it was a fully built up forward operating base we had uh we had these wooden barracks that um i think there was four of us to a room for most of us um in some cases five but every barracks had its own latrine, uh, you know, its own showers and everything, you know, fully built up mess hall for three meals a day. Um, most people had their own computer and would, you know, go on, you know, a lot of people go on the internet and that kind of thing. But we also had, you know, internet, like we had these big MWR buildings with lots of internet connections and phones. Um, we, uh, they, they would have a gym, actually had three gyms on base. Um, they had chapel, uh, all kinds of different religious services were available. Um, down, they had a main exchange complex where they'd have, you know, coffee shops. And I think they had some kind of a fast food place, but I don't remember which one it was. Um, so, yeah, the accommodations there were very nice. Another thing about Kosovo, I forgot to mention, I was actually a team leader at that point. So I had three medics working for me and I was also the... I was also in charge of medical record keeping and that kind of thing for my company. So I was a senior medic for my company. So it was, uh, that was another part of the challenge, you know, being not just responsible for myself, but medical records for, I think 93 people and then three other medics. So it was a lot of responsibility. Gotcha. Um, let's fast forward a few years. Um, you, you got out, um, of the reserves in 10, is that right? 2010? Yes. Okay. Yes. So fast forward uh, well beyond that, just about a year ago when um, when we withdrew from Afghanistan, when, when you were watching that on the television, any any thoughts come to your mind that you're comfortable talking about publicly? Um, well, since I'm not uh, since I didn't get a military pension, I'm not under the chain of command anymore. I think that was done totally wrong. Um, I think I don't know what Mr. Trump's strategy would have been. Um but I think that it would have been better than having no strategy at all. And I think that Mr. Biden just had no strategy at all. It was just like, pull it out and let's go home, uh, which I don't think was the right way to go about it. Um, I don't know if, Mr. say, Mr. Trump had been reelected and decided to pull out under his way. I'm not saying that nobody would have been hurt in the withdrawal, but we knew about the 13 that were killed in the withdrawal and that kind of thing and just the total chaos at the airport and all that. Um, I think it was done completely the wrong way. 
I think we could have saved a lot more lives if we'd had more of an orderly way of withdrawing. Um, I, I hate that we even had to withdraw from Afghanistan, but I think it was kind of inevitable. So you're, you're wearing an army shirt today. Um, right. Let's say you go out to, to go grocery shopping a couple hours from now and you have some kid that comes up to you and he's a 17 year old kid. And he's like, Hey, Hey man, I'm thinking about joining the army. Um, what advice would you give him on how to succeed in military service, whether it's the army, air force, um, any branch of service? Well, if he's going to go in, um, I would say for the Army, physical fitness is the number one thing. Um, I'd say be your own best advocate if you're going to go in the military. Um, look out for – start out by looking out for yourself and – your own career and what you're doing. And eventually you get promoted into a, some kind of a leadership position where you got to look out for, for others uh, as well as yourself. But uh, I would say it's not something to go into if you're looking to relax a lot. There's definitely always, even in the garden reserve, there's always responsibility for it because, you know, for nothing else in the garden reserves, you got to put in time between drill weekends to keep yourself in shape, um, to notify the unit if you got any kind of equipment issues or other issues. Um, so I'd say be prepared for a huge amount of responsibility that can be as much as 24 hours a day, seven days a week, depending on what you're doing. Um, and although we're not currently in the middle of a major conflict, uh, you know, <clears throat> it, it could happen again with not much notice. Um, how do you think that your time in service, um, your your experience and your training helped mold you into the man you are today? Um, well, I'd say it gave me a lot of responsibility and, you know, made me aware that that if I'm not paying attention to my own responsibilities, that somebody else could ultimately be impacted by that. Um, things like, you know, attending things properly, being on time um being respectful of superiors both military and civilian um things like you know self-discipline i'd say it's given me a lot of that uh also it's given me opportunities to see and do things that most other people don't get to see or do um there was a lot of times when you know, I'd be in the, in the national guard, you know, between drills, between deployments. And there were places I could go with a military ID card in my pocket that a lot of other people couldn't go. Um, places where, you know, showing a military ID can get you a big discount, uh, that kind of thing. Um, it, it was great at the time. It really was. Are you still involved in, um, in medical field or uh not right now but i was involved in ems for many years after i got out um i gave that up in i think 2016 did you find that your military training was helpful i think so yeah if nothing else being able to function in a stressful situation yeah mm -hmm. the one thing about it uh, unfortunately that's a problem that people have in my mos because when you get out of the military a lot of our skills that we had is 91 whiskeys and 68 whiskeys we can't use in the civilian world, at least not without going out and earning like a paramedic certification or becoming a nurse or a doctor or something like that. Like, for example, we can't do IVs, we can't intubate, we can't do chest tubes, we can't um, give any drugs. Um, some things carry over into being an EMT. In fact, that's part of the cert that's part of the curriculum at the AIT is the emt curriculum and if a person doesn't pass that they can't go on into the tactical part of the curriculum uh and but that emt does carry over in the into the civilian world and the army requires you to maintain it and they do provide continuing ed classes but um so i lost a lot of my skills when i uh when i was no longer a, a 91 whiskey but um that's the way it was. Yeah.
So in a few weeks, you're going to receive a copy of this videotape, and you're also going to get instructions on how you can submit this story to the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. So theoretically, as long as the U.S. government is still standing 100 years from now or 150 years from now, one of your great, great, great grandkids might stumble upon the video. What would you want them to know about your service to your country? Um, I'd want them to know that it was, that it made a difference. Um, you know, when I think about the, the kids that I was able to serve, uh, in, in country, uh, in both cases, um, you know, they're the future, I'm the past. And I want them to know that serving in the military makes a difference. It happens that I don't have any kids and I don't think I'll be able to, but I understand what you're saying. There are other kids who, you know, I'm, I, I myself, you know, I've gone and looked up people that I never knew just because I heard their name and thought it might be interesting to look them up um, in their military history and that kind of thing. And I know there will be people who will want to do that someday. Outstanding. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Just thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell, I've told my dad about this and he seems pretty interested in it. So I'll pass his information, your information on to him, if that's okay. Oh, that'd be fantastic. So yeah, the, the, the more the merrier, um, you, you'd be doing us a favor by sending yeah. us uh, veterans. So your, your, your family, um, guys that you still keep in contact with your, your units, as long as somebody had, had, had spent some time supporting operations overseas, right. we're interested. Oh, we also do 9-11 survivors. I don't know if you have any knowledge of anybody like that. 9-11 survivors, uh, Gold Star mothers. Anybody's got a story to tell about America at war. Okay. Um, I'm also pretty heavily involved in my local VFW. I'll pass the word out there. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. VFWs are a gold mine. So, okay. yeah, we'd love to. And, you know, one of the things you could pitch for that, too, is, you know, we would love to help document, you know, the post, you know, you know, collect stories from as many post members as you can from that particular VFW. So, you okay. know, the more guys we can get the merrier. OK, great. So on behalf of the Americans in wartime experience, I thank you for your time today. And more importantly, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for your support and thank you for your time.